Hello and welcome, I am the blacksmith and welcome to the forge. Today we'll be doing something a little bit different as we will be discussing morality rather than weapons, but of course we will be doing so through a historic lens and the actions of one of my favorite all-time historical figures, Henry V. While I still plan on making more weapon breakdowns in the future, between a full-time job, the time that goes into research, modeling, texturing, you know, editing the video, all of that, it takes quite a bit of time to get these out and therefore I wanted to make these kind of smaller videos where I just ramble about some really interesting uh, topics in, in history uh, just to kind of fill up the void and give you some content. But without further ado, Henry V, the warrior king of England. Now after the death of his father Henry IV in 1413, Henry would ascend to the throne at the age of 26. It only took about two years from that point for war to break out with France, and even though we will skim most of the political maneuverings of the time, you should really know that Henry made zero effort to avoid this war. Quite the contrary, he steered straight into it. And so it also wasn't long before a massive army was raised of around about 12,000 English troops, including archers and knights, and they would sail across the channel and make landfall at the coastal town of Harfleur. Now Harfleur was an extremely well reinforced city provided with you know the mo moats, uh, gate houses, nice concentric wall, everything you could hope for. And thus Henry wanted to take said city so he could use it as a fortified position through which supplies could flow from England and he could march on Paris and end this war swiftly and decisively. However, the city gave as good as it got and what followed was a lengthy and extremely costly siege. A siege that almost ended the entire campaign then and there. Now the English would blast the town with both cannons and trebuchets alike. They would try to undermine the walls just to be countermined again by the French. And the French forces would sally out regularly from the gates, making life a living hell for the English gunners at the front. And even as their walls and fortifications crumbled around them, the French occupants would still hold their ground, working tirelessly to repair the fortifications at night, while the English guns lay silent. They would cover the streets with mud to soften the impact of cannonballs. They would fight within their crumbling fortifications and they would hold way longer than the English were able to afford. But alas, despite the bravery of the French defenders, a relief force would never arrive. And after six weeks, they were forced to surrender. And even though the city had fallen, Henry's army had suffered greatly for it. Though these numbers are disputed, the English army would have consisted of some 12,000 men, but after the siege, only a measly 6,000 were left in fighting shape. Just because of casualties, desertion, and chiefly among them dysentery, which had taken hold across the army. And then, therefore, the original plan, which was to march on Paris, was no longer feasible with the leftovers of this once great army. So Henry got to thinking. Turning back now to England would be rather shameful, since having left with the splendor that he did and the grandeur, and a massive army of 12,000 Englishmen, and only having taken a single city, would be rather shameful. So what they would do instead is march along the French coast and meet up at the English-held city of Calais. However, marching north, the English army would have to cross the river Somme, and upon arriving there, even though Henry was cocky enough not to send a scouting party ahead, they found that the French defenses at the river crossing made it impossible to do so. So Henry was forced to turn his army inland into French country, so enemy territory, in the hopes that they might find a better crossing place further upstream. And this is just where their problems began. This delay gave the French time to amass a huge army that would have been bigger than even the original 12,000 men that the English departed with. And so a mad game of hide and seek began, with the English trying to steer clear as far as they could from the French army. And even though they would be constantly harassed by the French, especially the English longbowmen, which would get it really bad. At days, they would be marching with suddenly a small detachment of French cavalry swooping in 
cutting them down left and right to, before retreating, before relief from the English cavalry could arrive. This led Henry to make another decision. Each and every longbowman in his army would be forced to cross around about two meter long wooden pike that upon attacks from the French cavalry they were supposed to plant into the ground before him and so step aside and shoot from the relative cover that the pike would provide against this cavalry. However, I'm sure this was very small comfort to the longbowmen. You know, there was days where they could see the French army across the river and it was very clear to everyone that they were completely outnumbered. And I'm sure to them this just seems as extra weight they were supposed to carry towards their executions. And finally this would all come to a head as the French forced the English into open combat on a tiny strip of mud near the French town of Agincourt. And so now that we have this rough image of the events that have been leading up to the actual battle, let's consider for a second the forces that have been pitched against each other here. So on one hand we have Henry V with his British army of 6,000 men, give or take. This would have been around about 5,000 longbowmen and 1,000 knights. Now, do consider that they had been marching around about 320 kilometers to enemy territory, and they were largely suffering from dysentery as well. And on the other hand, we have the French army that would have consisted from anywhere between 20 and 30,000 men. Now, there are many accounts of how this battle would have played out, and I will just give you the one that I think is the most plausible. Now first what you need to understand is that this field of battle was no chance encounter whatsoever. They didn't just run into each other and start fighting, no. As the rules of chivalry would have dictated, both the English and the French armies would have agreed upon a field of battle that would give neither overwhelming benefit to one party nor overwhelming penalty to another. However, it seemed that the French army had been somewhat overconfident. And to be fair, who could blame them with the disparity in numbers between both parties? And thus they decided to meet on this relatively narrow field, sandwiched between two forests on both sides. Now, for those that have read The Art of War, you will be immediately be able to pick this out as desperate ground. However, the French did not account for the size of their own army. They would rely on shock and awe tactics. They would simply soften up the English front lines with crossbow and gunfire and then break it apart under waves and waves of French heavy cavalry, which is something that has served them very well in the past. However, their plans was already getting hampered in very small ways. Now nobles would bicker and argue for a space on the front line as having fought the English in what was likely to be certain victory anyways, which is make for a riveting dinner conversation. And however, this had the adverse effect that the crossbowmen of the French would be forced out of the front lines and onto the flanks where the French guns were already struggling to maintain an open line of fire anyways. On top of that, rain had been pouring the night before, turning this already muddy field into just a pool of sucking mud. However, I'm sure none of the French knights were too concerned as their numbers were so overwhelming anyways. Also, as a side note, we should point out that the difference in which French knights and English knights regarded their archers was quite large. Now, English knights already knew the value of their longbowmen for years and years. However, the French knights saw their crossbowmen, and as an extension, the English longbowmen as vastly inferior and barely considered to them to be worth their time. Now on the English side, Henry would likely have arranged his knights at the center with his longbowmen on the flanks protected behind the layers of their arranged pikes, undoubtedly trying to get the most value out of his longbowmen which had already proven so effective for the English in the past and just shown themselves to be an incredibly lethal weapon. However, the French were not stupid. They knew that they had the upper hand and the English army would only grow weaker over time. So there was no real reason for them to attack the English while they were in their most defensive position. Let the English come to them and Henry, not for the first time in his campaign, took a massive gamble. He knew that 
he would be in no shape to fight the same battle tomorrow. He could not let his men stand there for a day, retreat them, pack up camp, and just stand there for another day to day after. It just was not possible. If this battle was to be fought, it was to be fought today. And so he advanced with his 6,000 men on the vastly larger French host. He would march just until the French were in range of his English longbows. And the English longbowmen would simply just put their pikes again in the same position that they were before and start raining arrows onto the French. Now you need to know that a trained archer could fire as many as 10 arrows per minute. And there was 5,000 archers. The French were undoubtedly taken aback by this seemingly suicidal advance. However, under the rain of arrows, they were forced to charge, and so, di and so they did. The French cavalry would charge straight at the center of the British formation. However, the sucking mud slowed their advance, and the storm of arrows unleashed upon them would only slow it further. Now, most of the arrows would probably just dent harmlessly off their armor. However, if even just 1 in 20 arrows would find their mark, you know, firing through an eye slit, splintering off a chest plate and ricocheting up someone's neck, flying through the relatively unprotected pieces of the joints of the armor, or simply hitting a horse. The, the effect would have been devastating on the French cavalry. Men would fall to their deaths, horses would rampage through their ranks as they were hit by arrows, and the chaos would have been absolute. So the French charge would just be diminished to nothing but a slow march towards their death, as I am sure they would have caught on very quickly to the effectiveness of the English longbows and redirected their charge right at the flanks of the armies where the longbowmen were taking up their firing positions. And as they did so, they would have marched straight into the pikes of the English longbowmen. Horses would die on the spot, French riders would be thrown into the sucking mud, unable to get up to the weight of their armor. And the English longbowmen would simply cast aside their longbows and draw their secondary weapons, be it maces, axes, clubs, whatever they could get their hands on, and fall upon their French aggressors. So the battle was a complete and utter disaster for the French. As their deaths piled on in front of the English front lines, they would be forced to charge over the growing pile of bodies, where knights would drown and suffocate in the sucking mud and under the boots of their companions. With horses rampaging through their lines, men drowning in the mud and their charge having been reduced to nothing but the slowest of paces, the French army just stopped and a stalemate formed in the battle. The English would start taking prisoners among the French that had not died right then and there, and they would take anywhere between 700 and 1000 prisoners, and they got ample time to do so. Now the French would be bickering over who would take command of the counter charge, but they had so many problems with infighting, you know, Burgundian knights would not fight under knights of Orléans or the other way around, and their lack of leadership just gave the English so much time to prepare for their counter charge. However, it was in this stalemate that Henry V found himself looking across the battlefield and making an impossible decision. A decision that's still hotly debated to this day. And he ordered the execution of each and every prisoner that was captured. So he sent some knights and some of his men onto the battlefield to make sure that everyone would comply and the throats of each and every prisoner would be slit. And so we come to the real topic of this video. Was Henry V an evil man? A bloodthirsty tyrant? No. At least not from my point of view. Now while an English victory seemed certain, defeat was actually not such a distant prospect. Imagine the French army regrouped and they would, be, they would have been able to lead a real counter charge. And then the English would have been stuck with 1000 prisoners that they would have 
the leaf at their backs. Now considering their numbers were only 6,000, they would not have been able to guard set prisoners. And imagine leaving them unguarded at their backs. They rearmed themselves and fell upon the English back lines. This could have easily turned certain victory into complete and utter annihilation for the English. And so Henry V was left with a choice. Does he treat the prisoners as chivalry demands? Or does he sacrifice his honor to protect his men and victory for his country? Now clearly we know what choice he made. But does that make him an evil man? I don't think so. Instead, it seems like here we are faced with a classic moral dilemma. Or is it? A dilemma in this case being defined as a conflict of duties. When you are faced with conflict of duties, what would you do? Do you prioritize the duty to your honor to treat your prisoners as chivalry demands? The duty to your men, the duty of care to protect their lives and not leave an enemy at their backs? Or the duty to your country to prioritize victory at any cost? In this case, Henry chose the latter and he sacrificed his personal honor to protect his men and his country. So let's put ourselves in Henry's boots. Now we are at the head of our army. Victory within grasp, but defeat still a lingering prospect. The duty of care for our prisoners is morally instilled in us from birth. We would be raised with the ideals of chivalry. But so is the duty of care for our men as we, for the first time, commanded an army and grew to respect our archers and our knights. However, we cannot choose both. This puts us in a very strange situation, since we aren't simply dealing with a question of what we ought and ought not to do. Instead, we are provided with two contradictory moral reasons. What allows us to make a decision in such a situation is a matter of great discussion. Sometimes such a conflict is resolved because one moral reason overrides the other. However, I do not think that this is the case in our position. Another way is not to make any decision whatsoever. However, in our case, this conflicts as well, as not making any decision will jeopardize our victory and the lives of our men. This means that we always fail in one of our moral obligations, regardless of which choice we make, if any. The only way to get out of our impediment seems to sacrifice your honor, your men, your victory, a moral failure regardless of your choice. So let's return to the battlefield. Sword in hand, a crown on your head that surely seems to be growing heavier and heavier with each passing second. Now what choice will you make?